Hi, boys and girls. We're going to be reading the story, Harvesting Hope, the story of Cesar Chavez by Kathleen Kroll, illustrated by Yuyi Morales. Now, in my library, we have another version of this, but we realize, oh my goodness, there's a missing page. So we're going to read this story again with all the pages. Are you ready? Let's grow. Harvesting Hope. Until Cesar Chavez was 10, every summer night was like a fiesta. Relatives swarmed onto the ranch for barbecues with watermelon, lemonade, and fresh corn. Cesar and his brothers, sisters, and cousins settled down to sleep outside under netting to keep mosquitoes out. But who could sleep with uncles and aunts singing, spinning ghost stories, and telling magical tales of life back in Mexico? Cesar thought the whole world belonged to his family. The 80 acres of their ranch were an island in the shimmering Arizona desert and the starry skies were all their own. Wow, how wonderful it is to spend time with your family. Many years earlier, Cesar's grandfather had built their spacious adobe house to last forever with walls 18 inches thick. A vegetable garden, cows, and chickens supplied all the food they could want. With hundreds of cousins on farms nearby, there was always someone to play with. Cesar's best friend was his brother Richard. They never spent a day apart. Wow, look at them playing in the water. What wonderful memories that would make. Cesar was happy at home, was so happy at home that he was a little afraid when school started. On his first day, he grabbed the seat next to his older sister, Rita. The teacher moved to another seat and Cesar flew out of the door and ran home. It took three days of coaxing for him to return to school and take his place with the other first graders. Cesar was stubborn, but he was not a fighter. His mother cautioned her children against fighting, urging them to use their minds and mouths to work out conflicts. Do your family, does your family teach you to use your words? Have you heard that word? Use your words. Just like Cesar's family? Mm, looks like there's some concerned faces. I wonder what we'll read about now. Then, in 1937, the summer Cesar was 10, the trees around the ranch began to wilt. The sun baked the farm soil rock hard. A drought was choking the life out of Arizona. Without water for the crops, the Chavez family couldn't make money to pay its bills. There came a day when Cesar's mother couldn't stop crying. In a day, Cesar watched his father strap their position, possessions onto the roof of their old car. After a long struggle, the family no longer owned the ranch. They had no choice but to join the hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to the green valleys of California to look for work. Hmm, what happened here? Why did his family have to leave? Do you remember? Yes, they worked very hard but it looks like there was a drought. A drought is when there's no rain for a long time. When there's a drought, the plants can't get the water they need and they die. And if you're a farmer, you make money by selling your plants. And if you don't have any plants, you can't make money to feed your family like Cesar's family. So they had to move to find another place to work. That's why their faces are sad. I don't think they want to leave their home. Would you want to leave your home? Me neither. Cesar's old life had vanished. Now he and his family were migrants, working on other people's farms, crisscrossing California, picking whatever fruits and vegetables were in season. That must have been hard. Before they worked on their own farm, and now they have to work on other people's farms. When the Chavez family arrived at the first of their new homes in California, they found a battered old shed. 
Its doors were missing and garbage covered the dirt floor. Cold, damp air seeped into their bedding and clothes. They shared water and outdoor toilets with a dozen other families and overcrowding made everything filthy. The neighbors were constantly fighting and the noise upset Cesar. He had no place to play games with Richard. Meals were sometimes made of dandelion greens gathered along the road. Wow, that must have been very hard for them. They had everything before and now they have very little. What a change. I know they have each other still though. Glad that they get to still be together. Cesar swallowed his bitter homesickness and worked alongside his family. He was small and not very strong, but still a fierce worker. Nearly every crop caused torment. Torment is great pain and suffering. Yanking out beets broke the skin between his thumb and index finger. Grape vines sprayed with bug-killing chemicals made his eyes sting and his lungs wheeze. Lettuce had to be the worst. Thinning lettuce all day with a short-handled hoe would make hot spasms shoot through his back. Farm chores on someone else's farm instead of on his own felt like a form of slavery. The Chavez family talked constantly of saving enough money to buy back their ranch, but by each sundown the whole family had earned as little as 30 cents for the day's work. Boys and girls, 30 cents could not even buy me a pack of bubble gum right now. And that's what the family earned for working for the whole day. As the years blurred together, they spoke of the ranch less and less. Man, it sure would be very, very difficult to save enough money to buy back the ranch on just 30 cents a day. My goodness. Oh no, look at this picture. It says, I am a clown, I speak Spanish. And look at, does the teacher look like she's being very kind? No, why would it have such a mean and hateful thing written here? Let's read to find out. What does this say on the chalkboard? Speak English. Why would someone say something like that? Let's read. The towns weren't much better than the fields. White trade only signs were displayed in many stores and restaurants. None of the 35 schools Cesar attended over the years seemed like a safe place either. Once, after Cesar broke the rule about speaking English at all times, a teacher hung a sign on him that read, I am a clown. I speak Spanish. He came to hate school because of the conflicts, though he liked to learn. Even he considered his eighth grade graduation a miracle. After eighth grade, he dropped out to work in the fields full time. Now boys and girls, is this the way that people should be treated? Should he be treated like this? Absolutely not. This is grossly unacceptable. We should be kind to others and treat them with dignity and respect, no matter what language they speak, no matter where they're from. This was unkind and should not ever take place. If you see someone who's being mistreated because of their language or anything else, you should speak up and say, that's not right. We need to treat each other with kindness and respect. It makes me sad to see that people treated young Caesar that way. He loved school and then now he wants to leave school. His lack of schooling embarrassed Cesar for the rest of his life, but as a teenager, he just wanted to put food on his family's table. As he worked, it disturbed him that landowners treated their workers more like farm tools than human beings. They provided no clean drinking water, rest periods, or access to bathrooms. Anyone who complained was fired, beaten up, or sometimes even murdered. 
That sounds very unfair. So, like other migrant workers, Cesar was afraid and suspicious whenever outsiders showed up to try to help. How could they know about feeling so powerless? Who could battle such odds? Wow, this is truly unfair. This is not right. These pictures, wow. Yet Cesar had never forgotten his old life in Arizona and the jolt he'd felt when it was turned upside down. Farm work did not have to be this miserable. Reluctantly, he started paying attention to the outsiders. He began to think that maybe there was hope. And in his early 20s, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to fighting for change. Again, he crisscrossed California, this time to talk people into joining his fight. At first, out of every hundred workers he talked to, perhaps one would agree with him. One by one, this was how he started. I'm so glad he's fighting. He's looking for a way to make a difference. This needed to change. Mm, I wonder why these people are talking in his house. Let's read. At the first meeting Cesar organized, a dozen women gathered. He sat quietly in a corner. After 20 minutes, everyone started wondering when the organizer would show up. Cesar thought he might die of embarrassment. Well, I'm the organizer, he said, and forced himself to keep talking, hoping to inspire respect with his new suit and the mustache he was trying to grow. The women listened politely, and he was sure they did so out of pity. But despite his shyness, Cesar showed a knack for solving problems. People trusted him. With workers, he was endlessly patient and compassionate. With landowners, he was stubborn, demanding, and single-minded. He was learning to be a fighter. It takes a lot of people to make changes. I'm glad that Cesar is learning how to bring people together to make a change. In a fight for justice, he told everyone truth was a better weapon than violence. Nonviolence, he said, takes more guts. It meant using imagination to find ways to overcome powerlessness. More and more people listened. One night, 150 people poured into an old abandoned theater in Fresno. At this first meeting of the National Farm Workers Association, Cesar unveiled its flag, a bold black eagle, the sacred bird of the Aztec Indians. La causa, the cause, was born. Wow, looks like he's inspiring these people. Huelga. It was time to rebel, and the place was Delano. Here in the heart of the lush San Joaquin Valley, brilliant green vineyards reached toward every horizon. Poorly paid workers hunched over grapevines for most of each year. Then in 1965, the vineyard owners cut their pay even further. Cesar chose to fight just one of the 40 landowners, hopeful that others would get the message. As plump grapes drooped, thousands of workers walked off that company's fields in a strike or huelga. Grapes, when ripe, do not last long. So normally they'd be out there picking the grapes, but they decided, nope, I'm not going to pick any more grapes until you listen and try to make the things that are wrong right. Oh no, what do we see here? What's going on there? Let's read. The company fought back with everything from punches to bullets. Cesar refused to respond with violence. Violence would only hurt La Causa. Instead, he organized a march, a march of more than 300 miles. He and his supporters would walk from Delano to the state capitol in Sacramento to ask for the government's help. Wow, he must have been very brave 
and very self-controlled. They're using violence here to hurt the workers that are not using violence. The workers are peacefully protesting and yet the other people are not responding the same way. Let's see what happens. Mm. Cesar and 67 others started out one morning. Their first obstacle was the Delano Police Force, 30 of whose members locked arms to prevent the group from crossing the street. After three hours of arguing, in public, the chief of police backed down. Joyous marchers headed north under the sizzling sun. Their rallying cry was, Si se puede, or yes, it can be done. The first night, they reached Ducor. The markers slept outside the tiny cabin of the only person who would welcome them. Uh-oh, look at his feet. There's sores on it. Ouch. Single file, they continued, covering an average of 15 miles a day. They inched their way through the San Joaquin Valley while the unharvested grapes in Delano turned white with mold. Cesar developed painful blisters right away. That's what those are, blisters on his feet from all that walking. He and many others had blood seeping out of their shoes. The word spread. Along the way, farm workers offered food and drink as the marchers passed by. When the sun set, marchers lit candles and kept going. Wow, it looks like people are starting to help now. So all the people are getting together here and giving them food and water and helping them along in their way. Every bit helps. Whether you're marching or you're supporting those marchers, it's making a difference. Shelter was no longer a problem. Supporters began welcoming them each night with feasts. Every night was a rally. Our pilgrimage is the match, one speaker shouted, that will light our cause for all farm workers to see what is happening here. Another cried, we seek our basic God-given rights as human beings. Viva la causa! Eager supporters would keep the marchers up half the night talking about change. Every morning, the line of marchers swelled. Cesar always in the lead. Wow, people are letting them stay in their homes when before they didn't. People are starting to see what a difference they can make. Let's read more. On the ninth day, hundreds marched through Fresno. The long, peaceful march was a shock to people unaware of how California farm workers had to live. Now students, public officials, religious leaders, and citizens from everywhere offered to help. For the grape company, the publicity was becoming unbearable. And on the vines, the grapes continued to rot. In Modesto, on the 15th day, an exhilarated crowd celebrated Cesar's 38th birthday. Two days later, five thousand people met the marchers in Stockton with flowers, guitars, and accordions. Wow. So it looks like Cesar's march has drawn attention from people who didn't know what unfair things were happening. Once they found out, they tried to do something about it. Hmm, I wonder what they're signing. What's going on here? That evening, Cesar received a message that he was sure was a prank. But in case it was true, he left the march and had someone drive him all through the night to a mansion in wealthy Beverly Hills. Officials from the grape company were waiting for him. They were ready to recognize the authority of the National Farm Workers Association, promising a contract with a pay raise and better conditions. Cesar rushed back to join the march. Wow, it looks like they might do something to change those terrible conditions. On Easter Sunday, when the marchers arrived in Sacramento, the parade was 10,000 people strong. Whoa! Let me go back and figure out how many people started. Hmm. 
it looks like over here, it was Cesar and 67 others. So all together, maybe 68 people. And now there are 10,000. From the steps of the state capitol building, the joyous announcement was made to the public. Cesar Chavez had signed the first contract for farm workers in American history. Viva la causa! Huelga! Si se puede! Wow. Look at all those faces. It's like a celebration. Let's read why they're celebrating. The parade erupted into a giant fiesta. Crowds swarmed the steps, some people cheering, many weeping. Prancing horses carried men in mariachi outfits. Everyone sang and waved flowers or flags. They made a place of honor for the 57 marchers who had walked the entire journey. Speaker after speaker, addressing the audience in Spanish and in English, took the microphone. You cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer, cried one. You cannot pretend that we do not exist. The crowd celebrated until the sky was full of stars. Wow, that's a great achievement to celebrate. People coming together to make change. The march had taken its toll. Cesar's leg was swollen and he was running a high fever. Gently, he reminded everyone that the battle was not over. It is well to remember there must be courage, but also that in victory, there must be humility. Much more work lay ahead, but the victory was stunning. Some of the wealthiest people in the country had been forced to recognize some of the poorest as human beings. Cesar Chavez had won this fight without violence, and he would never be powerless again. Wow. Here's an author's note telling more about the story. Cesar Chavez was born near Yuma, Arizona in 1927. Before he founded the National Farm Workers Association, workers had no way to protect themselves. They had the longest hours, lowest wages, harshest conditions, shortest lifespans, and least power of any group of workers in America. We had never thought, Chavez said, that we could actually have any say in our lives. We were poor, we knew it, and we were beyond helping ourselves. After the walk to Sacramento, the longest protest march in U.S. history, Chavez was known to many as a hero. To show his continuing commitment to La Causa, he would occasionally stop eating. His hunger strikes would, attack, would attract publicity from around the world. Flying black eagles began to be printed on grape boxes from the few companies that offered contracts, and much of the public learned to avoid the others. It took five years of fasting by Chavez, of jail for him and other leaders, of marches, picketing, and bargaining before most of the largest Delano grape growers gave in. Millions of pounds of grapes had rotted, costing growers more than $25 million dollars. It was the first successful agricultural strike in U.S. history. Contracts promised better wages, health insurance, and other safeguards. 45 minutes after he signed the last of the grape contracts, Chavez was organizing a strike of lettuce workers elsewhere in California. Putting in 18-hour days, always on the move, he won many more fights on behalf of migrants, including the banning of the short-handled hoe, the cause of permanent back injury to thousands of workers. Wow, he's making a big difference. And so are all the people that are participating with him. Chavez credited his mother's teachings as a chief influence. He also took strength from his religious faith, his Mexican heritage, and his heroes, St. Francis of Assisi, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., leader of the African-American civil rights movement, and Mahatma Gandhi, who led the nonviolent fight for India's independence from Great Britain. Chavez's wife, Helen, provided indispensable help, as did his eight children, other family members, and loyal co-workers. In 1993, after a hunger strike lasting 36 days, Chavez never fully regained his strength. He died in his sleep at age 66. 
a crowd many times larger than the one that had greeted him in Sacramento, attended his funeral in Delano. Chavez was, and is, controversial. Especially among those resistant to change, he had many enemies and received constant death threats. Even today, some argue about him and his goals, and others have forgotten him or have never heard of him. But many continue to see him as a hero. For his utter sincerity, his belief that peaceful dedication to a cause is more effective than force, and his self-sacrifice in the face of overwhelming odds. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed reading this story just as much as I did. I enjoyed learning about Cesar Chavez and the difference he made for many people in our nation. Hope you enjoyed this story. If you liked it, go ahead and press the like button. If you want to hear more stories, don't forget to press subscribe. Until next time, have a great day. Bye-bye.